Hello, and welcome to Avi's Conversational Corner, a podcast on history, culture, and politics in a broad perspective. I am your host, Avi Wolf. You can find this and other episodes like it on Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Stitcher, and Spotify. And you can help support the podcast through Patreon. This episode's topic, Why I Love History. This podcast has now reached its 50th episode, and in honor of that, and in, with popular demand, I thought I might do something a little bit different. And instead of having the standard interview format where I talk to somebody else about their work or their ideas, I would do some, I would basically interview myself and try and talk, uh, tell audiences a little bit more about why it is I do what I do, why I love the subjects I cover so much. And perhaps to establish the basis for uh, what I intend to do uh, moving forward. I apologize that this is my first time doing a full length uh, lecture episode. Uh, so please uh, be gentle. So let's start with why podcasting. Well, uh, I was uh, fortunately blessed after hard as it is to believe being a soprano when I was a younger child, uh, my voice dropped dramatically and every member of my family told me that I have a radio voice and I should do podcasting and get on radio and so on and so forth. So after a lot of, uh, after a lot of encouragement and a lot of, uh, pestering, I decided to give it a try. I also found when I started doing this and as I continued doing this, that it is a very enjoyable endeavor because I get to choose and discuss things that I enjoy. Uh, I have complete control over the topics and the content. Uh, and I have something to focus on that is not doom scrolling through social media or work or other issues, but solely something that I love. But why history? People who have gone through the episodes, uh, the early episodes that I did, will notice that I covered a wide range of topics. And this was because I was at the, I at the time wanted to cast a very wide net to cover anything I was interested in. But ultimately I decided to focus almost exclusively uh, on the study and the teaching and concepts of history uh, in various capacities and why that. For starters, I am the son of a university professor, uh, uh, Professor Jeffrey Wolf, who got a doctorate in Jewish history at Harvard. So I come by it honestly. Although the truth is, is that uh, when I was a kid and I, when I was a teenager, I liked history, but I also liked things like science and other stuff. I really only caught the history bug as a late teenager when I became a massive, massive Civil War buff. And I would, uh, I still remember debating... Uh, pro-union positions against pro-confederate people on uh, message boards and defending the honor of people like uh, General U.S. Grant against those who thought he was a, an incompetent butcher. Uh, and ever since then, I have voraciously read anything I can possibly get my hands on uh, on, hit, on, the hit, on the history of the human race in all sorts of capacities. Uh, scholarly articles, scholarly books. Uh, I love watching many of the uh, the history channels on YouTube and the, some of the old documentaries, many of which still hold up today. Um, and I love talking about these issues also on Twitter uh, with uh, many professors who love doing the same. So that's more or less why uh, this podcast, while it didn't start out that way, has effectively become uh, a history podcast. Of course, history that I am interested in and that I hope my listeners are interested in as well. What about my favorite period of history? Uh, this is going to sound trite or cliche, but it's true. My favorite period of history is whatever I'm studying at the moment. Uh, I have gone through periods. I was a Civil War buff. Uh, during the Second Intifada, I was very, I read an enormous amount on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, there was a period where I read a lot about the World War II Eastern Front, and I very much enjoyed, for instance, uh, the YouTube docudrama Soviet Storm, uh, which taught me a lot 
about uh, the ins and outs of that often misunderstood uh, period. Uh, I was a massive World War I um, buff and still very much consider it to be a very uh, fascinating era uh, during the centennial, the 100 years since the, the event occurred, because I felt that because a lot of people sort of dodge and avoid the, uh, that event because unlike things like, say, World War II or the Civil War or stuff like that, it's not a simple morality tale or cannot, e cannot really easily be made as a simple morality tale of good guys versus bad guys. It's complicated. It's messy. Um, it, can be, it can be quite depressing. Uh, but it nevertheless so profoundly affected the way we think in so many ways we often do not understand. And we often misunderstand uh, how and why those people thought and how why they did what they did, that I very much enjoyed studying the war and I don't regret it for a second. Um, which brings me to the Gilded Age. Um, one other thing about my love of history is that I love studying periods, especially nowadays, that people tend to study a little less like World War I because they're messier, because they're more ambiguous, because it's not always clear who was in the right and who was in the wrong, but which nevertheless profoundly affected and affect the way we think, where many of the debates we have were started then and often uh, done better back then. Um, and indeed, I came to the conclusion, having seen all sorts of historical analogies made between our era and say the Civil War or the era of construction or the era of the civil rights movement, I really think our era is a lot more like the Gilded Age. Not one-to-one, -one, not, a, not a perfect um, analogy, but close enough. Consider the, consider the parallels. Both involved an incredibly rapid amount of technological development. People could connect with each other first through the spread of the telegraph and then through the spread of the telephone. And with, uh, and with modern communication, first with, uh, first with railroads and then with cars. Uh, technology, society were changing very fast. And a lot of people didn't even understand what was happening and were trying to adapt as best they could with different people trying to control it in different ways and other people saying, let it go as it will. And... There was a very intense partisanship in that era with both parties often viciously, viciously, you think today's party, par, uh, politics are vicious, viciously attacking each other as basically fundamentally almost illegitimate or maybe entirely illegitimate uh, and arguing that if they don't win every election, then the country will collapse. Sound familiar? Um, and it's also an era where we can examine and test a lot of ideas, uh, especially, I think, um, the left loves the, uh, the, prog the, the progressive era, which sort of dovetails with the Gilded Age, where um, progressive uh, intellectuals and groups and politicians and people in power tried to control it with all sorts of technocratic concepts. But I think that it's also a very fascinating and important era for people on the right, uh, not just the economic right. The economic right, um, obviously, this is a massive laboratory for seeing uh, how an almost entirely privatized economy operates. What are the good things? What are the bad things? What regulations were good? What regulations were bad? Um, just how, uh, just how much monopoly is good or bad, uh, whether or not this is a good thing to return to or not. But also, I think, for the thicker conservative right, the communitarian right, the traditional right, because this, like our own period, is a time in which, not even because of any particular ideology, but simply because people were doing all sorts of things differently than they had in the past, that all sorts of old, that all sorts of, uh, communities were coming apart or weakening or loosening all sorts of rules on uh, how you get married, how you get a job, uh, what you should and shouldn't do uh, were changing. And how you deal with that and how you deal with ch uh, all sorts of intellectual challenges, that happened a lot in the Gilded Age. 
and it's happening a lot in our time. And even if they don't necessarily have the answers we would agree with today, um, they nevertheless uh, might provide models of how to cope uh, adapted for our own times. And indeed, one of the things that um, one of the things that uh, intellectuals on the right like to emphasize is Alexis de Tocqueville. Now, de Tocqueville obviously wrote about the time of the Jacksonian era, but as Professor Samuel Goldman rightly noted, and as you'll see in my interview with uh, David Beto, uh, this was very much a golden age of people uh, organizing in order to help each other. This was the golden age of civil society. Uh, people combined for all sorts of reasons to ensure mutual insurance, to ensure uh, doctor's visits, to work on mutual education and all sorts of other things. And it would be is fascinating to study and look at this kind of era before everything became government dictated or government run and so on and so forth uh, to see how perhaps such uh, missions and ideas could be revived today. Uh, one of the questions I was asked, uh, oh, so before I go to that, the, I decided to name uh, the podcast on the Gilded Age, Stumbling Colossus. And it is, I did so uh, uh, to correspond with uh, the history of a historian H.W. Brand's American Colossus, uh, a book which is sadly not uh, well known enough which uh, discusses the power of how capitalism made America between 1865 and 1900, uh, as opposed to politics. Now, I don't entirely agree with brands that politics was basically irrelevant, um, but I do agree with him that this was very much the um, era in which uh, economic forces uh, determine things far beyond and above uh, what we might understand today. Uh, and I decided, but I decided to call my podcast Stumbling Colossus because, as I said before, while the Colossus was moving, right, while, the, while these uh, forces were moving, uh, not just parties, but uh, religious movements and communities and just average American individuals, both native and immigrant, uh, were kind of in the dark, finding their way, trying to see how to deal with so much change with so many different ideas, with so many different new things, and trying to figure out, well, is the old system of America enough? Do we need new ways to do things? Um, sh what should we embrace and what should we not? And I, so I felt that this was very much an era in which America became a power, but became a power basically finding its way and very often coming up with ways to deal with all sorts of problems almost on the fly. So it's an era of great experimentation at the local, at the state, at the federal, and at the individual levels in figuring out how to, how to, how to be an American and how to maintain an America and deciding what America should be in an era when America was fundamentally transforming. Um, so back to the, uh, I think one of the most important questions I was asked uh, when I did an AMA on Twitter was, who do you think is the most important and overlooked persona of the Gilded Age? Um, and once again, my answer is going to be trite and cliche, but I very much stand by it and will defend it against uh, any newcomers. I think the most overlooked and important character of the Gilded Age is the average American. Not any president, not any congressional leader, not any robber baron, um, not any progressive elite. I realize that's a bit controversial, but hear me out. Um, at the end of the day, because Americans were left to their own devices so much, because they could move around and choose uh, different forms of employment, uh, different places to live, different ways to live, because the government, because most governments still ran things more or less with a fairly light touch, and even uh, the robber barons who had some, who had accumulated so much power, were still uh, at the mercy, like everybody else, of the American consumer, of the person buying their products. At the end of the day, uh, the people who really determined how America developed were 
the average Americans, deciding with their dollars and with their votes how things would go, uh, ultimately determining um, how the country would be shaped uh, at every level. And it's also important because the history of the Gilded Age is a history that is overwhelmingly written by and for people who love the progressives. Uh, and at most, you will have people on the libertarian side who write uh, histories by and for people who love the robber barons because of their contribution to, uh, to um, the American economy and often cultural life. Uh, and the average American, the average person for whom this is all supposed to be about, tends to get dropped or treated as an afterthought or treated as simply <clears throat> or treated as simply someone who is either, I guess, suffering from false consciousness because they should all be agreeing with the robber barons or they should all be agreeing with the they should all be agreeing with the progressives and not as uh, men and women who stand on their, on their own right, who have their own opinions, often quite nuanced and even contradictory. Uh, and I think that the fundamentally, almost extremely democratic uh, nature of the Gilded Age, this was an era with extremely high voting rates and political participation, and as I said, high levels of civil society involvement, uh, I think that they are the most important characters of the Gilded Age, and they're the ones I try to focus on the most. You'll notice that I have not yet had a single episode devoted to any of the robber barons or the people who became incredibly wealthy through monopoly or mass-based service. I intend to eventually do that, but the omission is deliberate because they're not the story. They're a big part of the story, but they're not the main protagonist. For me, the main protagonist is the average American. And whatever lessons we learn for today, I want to be about learning lessons, not just for elites, whether economic uh, or intellectual or political, but first and foremost, uh, for the average citizen. In addition to that series, uh, I decided to launch a Republican Leaders series. Uh, I should have called it that, but I was too lazy. Um, where I interview uh, people about uh, important Republican congressional leaders, people like Everett Dirksen, Robert Taft, uh, and others uh, planned in uh, Thomas Dewey, and others planned in the future, simply because um, I feel like a lot of conservative intellectual discourse and just right-wing intellectual discourse in general is extremely, extremely president-heavy. Um, and on the one hand, in the abstract, they say Congress should do this and Congress should do that. On the other hand, they rarely, if ever, discuss concrete role models of congressional leaders who really achieved much in terms either of legislation or oversight or being uh, men and women of ideas. And I really feel that in our time, we suffer from a distinct lack of role models. We don't discuss role models uh, in community. We just talk about, oh, they should build community in the abstract. We, 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 we blather on in the abstract about the Tocqueville, but we never mention, uh, or we don't mention enough, concrete examples of successful, uh, continuous uh, community organizations or groups, uh, either from the past or in the present or planned for the future. Um, so I really thought that I would uh, focus on um, people at the uh, congressional, uh, congressional level, either as leaders or people who are committee leaders, and I'm hoping also to work on people who are governors and maybe, maybe even mayors, to try and provide not exact role models. I'm not a member of the, you should be exactly like so-and-so person. We, we always live in different circumstances than that person, either in time or in space or in both. But I do think that it is very important that if the right is to be rebuilt for the 21st century, then it needs to talk about concrete history, concrete examples, concrete policies, concrete examples of how to compromise and how not to compromise, how to get your way and how not to get your way, and not just to talk about the founding fathers in the abstract and not just to talk about speeches in the abstract or theories in the abstract, or ideas in the abstract. Uh, we end up falling in, I guess, into the trap we, we always argue liberals do, in that we end up talking about uh, 
almost mathematical formulas and not enough about messy, but more tangible and more concrete uh, people and ideas uh, and events. So that that's the point there. Um, in terms of my plans for the future, uh, I hope it, with regard to the Gilded Age to focus more on regions. I have, I hope, an upcoming uh, podcast on the famous closing of the frontier declared by the historian uh, Frederick Jackson Turner, how the, how the Gilded Age West was won and how the crisis of actually winning led to a lot of uh, interesting ferment and discussion about what it means to be American, uh, where America should go from there. I also want to focus a lot more on popular culture. Like I said, the average American. I would like to do an episode on vaudeville, uh, on the spread of classical music and opera, which was often quite in the popular range, uh, and a whole lot more. I want to do an episode on P.T. Barnum, the master of popular culture in this era, uh, as well as discuss uh, a very controversial, but nevertheless very important figure for this era, uh, Anthony Comstock, uh, who was very much part of, uh, in my interview with Gaines Foster, part of the effort at moral reconstruction of the United States as an even more virtuous nation at a time when mores and morals seem to be loosening after the war and with everyone on the move. Uh, in my Republican Leader series, I am hoping to do um, episodes on Howard Baker, the Republican Senate leader, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was very much the ideas man uh, for the Republican Party in the later Gilded Age. Uh, and I also want to focus uh, on powerful and influential women, uh, two uh, of which are Alice Longworth Roosevelt and Margaret Chase Smith. Uh, if my listeners, either Patreon supporters or otherwise, uh, have other ideas, you are free to DM me my, on Twitter, uh, Avi Wolf, A-V-I-W-O-O-L-F, uh, with, uh, with ideas and suggestions. I will consider them. I can't promise I'll take them up, but I will consider them. Uh, and I hope you continue to listen in, to enjoy, uh, give me constructive feedback, uh, if need be. Uh, and here's hoping that we, uh, get to the hundredth episode of Avi's Conversational Corner. That is all for now. I would like to once again remind my listeners that you can listen to this podcast on Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Amazon Music, and Spotify. And you can support the podcast on Patreon uh, under the title Avi's Conversational Corner. Thank you very much.